So this is the application we have before. Um, right. added a couple, so the, I, I know myself and Mr. Hanlon have both been uh, reviewing things. I've just sort of put them together in a single file just to make it a little simpler. Um, so Pat, you had suggested parenthetically describing the subsidizing agency as mass housing or other subsidizing agency. Uh, which... Mr. Chairman, that that is actually done later on. It was done inconsistently. And the idea okay. is, is here is just to do it the first time and then talk about subsidizing agency without having to go through the qualification each subsequent time. Okay. Um, everything else here was pretty straightforward. Uh, last time we had the 6.54% uh, from April 27th, 2022, that was from the Department of Housing and Community Development, so, uh, housing inventory. So that's just confirming those. Um, and Word would like dashes. Uh, that appears in a, a few places where Word is making some corrections. Um, but I had a few sections to add. So this is factual findings on location. Uh, so there was testimony in the record that the existing sidewalk along Massachusetts Avenue adjacent to the project is in fair condition, but generally not in compliance with state and federal accessibility guidelines. Um, that was a finding that was made by uh, Tetra Tech, as a, and that was the basis of their then conditional recommendation uh, that the applicant repair the crosswalk um, that is nearby. And, which was something that the applicant had agreed to do. So I just wanted to make sure that we got the, the finding in to justify the, the condition. So that's the reason for, I'm recommending we add that. Um, and then similarly from Tetra Tech, the traffic study indicated sight lines for traffic exiting the parking area would be diminished by parking vehicles along Massachusetts Avenue to the south of the proposed driveway. It was recommended that the that parking restrictions be pursued with the town for the area immediately south of the driveway. This study also identified that an existing bus stop is located immediately north of the driveway. Um, and similarly, putting that in because um, it was noted as a finding, the board has no, no jurisdiction or discretion to actually change the parking on the street or to dedicate some of those spaces in the short term. That is something that can only be done by the select board. Um, and so the we're just including it here as a finding, and then um, it, we can put in a condition that the that the applicant is requested to you know have this conversation with the town, but we cannot go ahead and do it ourselves. Um, and then similarly, the existing mid block crosswalk on Massachusetts Avenue, located approximately 425 feet south of the site, is faded, and the existing curb cuts do not meet accessibility standards. Crosswalk will be utilized by tenants of the proposed development to access recreational and educational resources on the opposite side of the street. And that ties again to a condition later on. Um, and here, I'm not sure why there's a correction from. One number to the exact same number. I'll fix that. Um, there we go. What was number twenty three is down number. It doesn't make sense. Seventeen. 20. Um, the the project is required to obtain an order of conditions in the Arlington Conservation Commission pursuant to the Wetlands Protection Act. Conditions are included in the condition section J order of conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so just to explain why they're in there, because that was a decree, that was something that uh, the applicant had requested. So I just want to make sure that was there. Um, again, here's the first time we use the term aura for the adjacent upland resource area. So just adding the parenthetical here. Um, last time we had talked about uh what's listed here is paragraph 22 um and adding the word grading into that line of things just to because there will be grading involved um here a parenthetical for noaa um and mr hamlin had confirmed it's atlas 14 plus so we're just gonna make sure we're keeping that consistent uh under transportation network um just want to add the 
uh, access to the Miniman bikeway is available off Brattle Street to the north of the project, just to sort of reinforce the need for bicycle parking. Um, and then at the bus stop, the project is adjacent to the Massachusetts Avenue at Brattle Street MBTA stop bus stop and across the street from the Massachusetts Avenue at Monotomy Road MBTA bus stop. Both stops are served by the Route six, Route 77. Um, make sure that was in the record as well. Um, then under civil engineering, we had uh, just adjusted the language in the in under 29. Uh, similarly in 31, because this is the second time we mentioned NOAA, so just moved that parenthetical up to the earlier iteration. Um, and then, so here we're looking to add, so the project will require clear cutting of trees from the site, including a healthy significant London plane tree, um, which is a comment from the tr uh, tree committee's report. So as noted in the comments provided by the tree committee, replacing replacing the lost canopy of this individual four foot diameter, 70 foot tall tree would take over 30 years. Mitigation fees for tree removal were established to protect the town's existing tree canopy. Um, and so that was added because uh, we had discussed previously the possibility of adding a, um, uh, a condition about adding street trees. And so this would be the finding that would lead to that condition. Um, and then 39 applicant and contractor are to sign the operation maintenance erosion sedimentation control program for our proposed stormwater management system located at 1021, 1025 Massachusetts Avenue, Arlington, Massachusetts. Um, Pat, was this one that you had added? No, no, it wasn't. It was uh, something that I don't know where it came from. I okay. did. I did make an effort to try to straighten out the formatting here but i was unsuccessful so i decided <laughs> yeah it's fighting fighting with the with word is not easy um i'm not entirely sure where that one came from because that is that i mean it's the thing is is the, i would assume that the state that the concom were would have said that Right, but that's that's more a condition than a finding. That's yeah. No, I agree. It, it's it's an order to the condition to do something. I I don't know why it's here. I I, I don't accept responsibility for it. <laughs> I don't recall sticking it in either. But word does. But I'm, weird I'm just wondering if it came in somehow through the through something that had to do with concom because it seems like it's the sort of thing that they would have to. I mean, an operation and maintenance and erosion sedimentation control program is would be meat and potatoes for them. Yeah. Let's see. Can I just kind of put a highlight on it here? Okay. Come back to it. Um, then under affordability and local concerns, um, I want to include this statement from Karen Kelleher, the chair of the Towns Affordable Housing Trust uh, development represent, presents an opportunity to substantially increase the number of permanently affordable home ownership units in Arlington without subsidy from the town. This is a critical opportunity without recent precedent. Good to have that there. Um, and then we hadn't didn't have anything in there about the historic before. Uh, so I would want to put something in the, the existing building at it's not 1012, 1021. It's actually 10 not 1023 either. Well, it's 1021 through 1023, I thought. Oh, that's the only thing that's on the site. Okay. Yeah. So 1021, 1023 Massachusetts Avenue is on the Arlington Historic Structures Inventory. And its inventory number is ARL 612. Requiring a determination from the Arlington Historic Commission whether the structure is preferably retained under the demolition delay bylaw. A formal hearing was on the AHC's agenda for September 7, 2021, but it was postponed to October 5, 2021. The formal hearing never took place under Mass General Law Chapter 40C. If a decision is not rendered within 60 days, a certificate of hardship is considered to have been constructively issued. 
However, if the AHC had issued a one-year demolition delay at that hearing, it would have run out before the comprehensive permit application was filed. The AHC held a hearing to discuss the property on April 4th, 2023, and the official record of the hearing was not released in time to be included in the board's record. So it sort of just states factually where we are in regards to that building. Um, and then the board acknowledges concerns raised by Butters and other interested parties about the project scale, and the elimination of the existing tree canopy, which could lead to an increase in heat island effects in the area. Um, and then I took out the line about the specimen sycamore tree because it was mentioned previously um, in the new paragraph. So those were all the existing changes and then the additional proposed changes to uh, the findings. Are there with the exception of this number 39 here, are there any questions about any of that? None, we'll go ahead into the conditions. Um, so these are just the identifying what documents are included. Um, there was a, oh, there was an earlier, the draft, that we had received before the April 25th hearing from the applicant had a differently identified the photometric plans. So I just changed it to their, what they, how they had identified it. Uh, that's all that that is. Um, all the rest of this we have already reviewed. Um, there was a bit of question about sub C here. So this has to do with, um, final plans and such, um, and particularly about the landscaping plans. So um, I had wanted to, this is just something I think we just need to make sure that we're covering this correctly. So this would be um, prior to any construction or site development activities um, that they would need to submit to the board for review and administrative approval, the following final drawings and plans to identify as final plans for review and approval by the town. Such approval to be that the plans conform to the requirements of this comprehensive permit and incorporate the relevant conditions herein. Final plans shall also incorporate all relevant conditions and requirements of permitting agencies having jurisdiction. Uh, so one is the final engineering drawings and plans with applicable sheets signed and sealed by the professional land surveyor of record and the professional civil engineer of record. Uh, Final architectural plan signed by and sealed by the registered architect of record. Final landscape plan signed and sealed by the registered landscape architect of record. Mm. Final lighting plan signed and sealed by a professional engineer. Um, and this is just to to match the list uh, of plan sets that were, you know, identified here earlier. Um, so that we're looking for final plans. We're not looking for to have them create something new which is sort of what the lands this former section d had included mr um, chairman uh, mr hanlon um with respect to the excuse me when when we are at the approved plans the first set of plans the ones yep. that are that are submitted by patriot engineering are not actually called final engineering plan drawings and plans mm -hmm. uh i think their name has got the word comprehensive in it and uh I guess I wasn't quite sure whether as a matter of substance, uh, the intent is that for the Patriot engineering plans to be essentially what later is called about by the fi final engineering plans, mm -hmm. or whether there's somehow some overlap between categories. Because if there's not an overlap between categories, it becomes quite easy just to designate that regardless of what it's called uh, on the comprehensive permit plan set, uh, that that particular set of plans that I referred to in that part of 8.2 uh, is corresponds with the final plans that are called final engineering plans uh, in C1 here. Um, and then that, uh, I mean, if that is actually accurate, that would make it really easy to then map all of the final plans back to some specific approved plan, which would be nice if again if if it's if it's what's actually intended i would turn to mr alfin and ask him what his sense is on how he might want to address this 
Yeah, I, I think that the way that it's drafted is fine. What you want for a decision is say what we're basing our decision on, but you need to make certain changes to comply with the decision. Mm -hmm. And those plans will be submitted to the town to confirm that they've complied with the conditions of the decision. So it's not so important how you phrase that. I think the way that you drafted this probably works. Uh, something like the applicant will submit final plans for approval, and those will be the plans uh, that will uh, will control the decision uh, going forward. I guess the reason I was a little bit concerned about that is that the when you get down later, the some of the submission requirements for pre-construction are different depending on which kind of plan it is. Right. But but again, all I really want out of all of this is to there be no ambiguity when it comes time to reviewing the final plans. With the architectural plans, we have something called the architectural plans. With the landscape plan, we have something called the landscape plan. So we know exactly which approved plan is going to be reviewed to for compliance with the final plan. I think the intent is to do the same thing with the first one here and to compare that to the Patriot uh, engineering plans that are referred to as the comprehensive plan set earlier on. And again, if that's true, it eliminates all possible ambiguity. You have a specific plan for final and one approval and one approved plan, and you're basically looking for substantial compliance in each one. Now, my yeah, my only concern is if there's a major change that you're that that needs to happen on the plan according to the conditions of the decision. Uh, so you know, it, it may be we have this set of plans dated. Um, you know, May 1st, 2023, uh, but that needs to show that the driveway entrance is in this location, not that in th that location. Yeah, so, I think, but we already have a pr provision to deal with that, don't we? The minor changes, are things that well, are defined as minor right, changes and, are and, approvable and that, by the... Right, and that's true. Minor changes are permitted, but we want to try to avoid uh, a determination um, by by uh, by the town of what is a major major or minor change. Um, so, like I said, typically the way this is handled is, um, you know, uh, it, it's administratively approved. Typically, in most towns, sometimes it's given back to the board, but typically it's a, it's approved by the building commissioner or the ZBA clerk to say uh, the plans here are now the plans going forward. Uh, and you can just simply state that the final set of plans will mostly comply with the plan date May 1st, 2023, or whatever you have you, have you uh, subject to some changes in order to comply with the decision. And I'm happy to work uh, on, on framing that a little bit better than what we have. Uh, but that's essentially what, what we do with most decisions. Yeah, I think there's no real dis disagreement as to what it is that we want here. I hope there's not. Mm -hmm. it, it is important that the approved plans are the basic constitution going forward uh, and that the additional flexibility comes from various other things that happen in the process. And I think yeah. that is true. That is clear with respect to everything other than the than the for, than the Patriot engineering set. And I, I'm pretty content that that it works either way uh i think um and i just and i doubt that it's going to be a practical problem yeah okay so do we need to make a change at this stage or do we leave it as is as... i'd let it alone i guess okay um any other questions about these sections? Mr. Chair. Mr. Rigadelli. Uh, just one question. Are, so do we, uh, just having not done this process before, do, yeah. um, do we review those plans or does the town review those plans? So the town will review them. Okay. Um, but they're technically they're submitted to the board, but the town will get a review. Okay, understood. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
and then we removing so plans submitted 30 days prior to anticipated date of commencement that's the language that was there before then there was this whole section about submitting a landscaping plan which sort of read as if they had never done a landscaping plan before so that's why we took it out of here and put it in up in here um well, we have this sort of final paragraph that all plantings shall consist of native non-invasive drought tolerant species plantings installed along drives and walkways shall also be salt tolerant there was this middle paragraph uh middle section of the paragraph about how long they're supposed to be monitored whatnot and i'm recommending that we just replace that with that says requirements for maintenance monitoring and replacement of plants and trees shall be as listed in the order of conditions included as condition j48 um and so that is what the order of conditions for their uh, their state permit includes. And so just instead of having it in multiple places, just referencing it in that one location. And then the condo, condo doc shall address ongoing maintenance of the landscaping features. Um, and then again, as well, this sub D here, sub, uh, submit to the director of planning and community development, the final construction mitigation plan including but not limited to and just um saying it this way because we did already review a construction mitigation plan um we did there was not they're not creating it for this purpose mr chairman mr dupont so if you would just uh, go back up to the yellow where you'd made yep. the change I had uh, made comments on a prior iteration of this, so I think that you sort of uh, superseded what I was wondering, but do you recall what is the requirement in J48 in terms of uh, how long they have to care for those plants? Is it perpetuity or is there an actual period of time? Uh, so it's this year. 10 years? So it's 10 years. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Thanks. So there's an initial three-year monitoring period. Um, and then it, oh, wait a second. Okay. I have to look at this a little more carefully because this actually, I think, may have referenced that earlier paragraph again. I think it's J47 is the one that more or less corresponds with what the substance was earlier. Okay. And then J48, just to be clear, this is something that comes out, not does not come out of the CONCOM proceeding. They're accepting the, the uh, offer that Mr. Feldman made to us mm -hmm. earlier on and saying, in effect, that our extra seven years applies as part of their permit too. Somewhere along the line, and I thought, and I do think that the way we phrased it up above with, with the cross-reference to J48 uh, needs to be something that we are stating on as part of the comprehensive permit. So you don't get, you, you don't get a cycle that's going round and round. So everybody's referring mm -hmm. to everybody else's uh, condition and nobody actually has a condition. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this one is sub 48, J48. The ultimately, that is a comprehensive permit type condition rather than a concom uh, type condition. And if you go back to the language that started this discussion, we should look at it and make sure that it does what we intend in that regard. I thought it did when I first saw it. Um, so this once is where here, right, where the yeah. reference is. Right. So this first, the part that's crossed out is similar to j47 it's slightly different uh, j47 is more restrictive so i think possibly what we should just say is instead of referencing condition j48 is reference conditions j47 and j48 well it that doesn't i mean again that doesn't that doesn't help my problem my mm -hmm. problem is that somewhere here it should i don't what the, what the concom says is that because of the agreement they have with us yeah. they're including our the substance of j48 there and i okay. think that we ought to be clear that, that that comes from our comprehensive permit and we should be we we can say the text is the same as in j48 but we should be clear that we're in the ones who are initially imposing that condition So 
In other words, they're they're deferring to us. We're not deferring to them on that, which is a little bit different from the way it looks. Okay. I wonder if it's possible to say oh. requirements for maintenance monitoring and whatever uh, mm -hmm. uh, shall be as agreed, I mean, agreed by the applicant and listed in condition 48. But I, all I'm really trying to do is get rid of any implication that condition 48 of its own force is what's applying this condition, but it does list it well. <laughs> You don't want to repeat it. So it said requirements for maintenance, monitoring, or replacement of plants and trees shall be as agreed to agreed to by the applicant and as listed in the order of conditions included as conditions J47 and J48. I guess that's okay. I think that's okay. Sure. Okay. And then moving on. Um, by a proof of such reporting to the board. Um, and then again, here the removal of mass housing is just because we put the parenthetical higher up. Um, obtain all this. One of the permits they will require, they will need a demolition permit because there is an existing building here. So they need to obtain demolition building, electrical plumbing, and associated permits. Um, and then I had added a K, the applicant shall receive written approval from the Arlington Fire Chief or his, her designated representative for the proposed building emergency access prior to issuance of a building permit. Um, there was definitely some concern expressed that, you know, they would not have adequate access. Um, it is a part of the fire chief's, part of the fire department's job to, um, review. So this is just including that. Not sure why that got changed. Um, and then prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall submit to the board for review by its council copy of the condominium association master deed trust and rules and regulations to ensure such documents contain a provision that the condominium association is subject to this decision at a minimum the condominium association documents shall address issues relating to public access to the retail space snow removal trash removal maintenance of the urban park and other issues addressed in the conditions herein and i think I don't think urban park is the term that they're using. Restored wetland is their term. I'm not so sure that's right, is it? I think of the restored wetlands as the stuff they're doing down there by the street. Oh, you're right. You're right. The, the urban park uh, consists of that whole area, much of which is not in the aura at all that is right. designed in general as as the quid pro quo for getting rid of all the, the trees that eventually produces a nice forest that will take some time to establish. Right. Um, I would say yeah. the landscape plan you must have some word, I would think, to use for this. And maybe that's the place to look for it, to find the convenient moniker to stick in here. Restored woodland, that was it. Yep, I think that's right.
and then uh, prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant is encouraged to consider requesting two on-street parking spaces in front of the project be designated as short-term parking or loading spaces. Um, I suppose I ought to indicate that is um, a request on the designation. It's a request to be made of the select board. If it was spelled correctly. <laughs> So I have a question here about our authority. This is, I mean, this is basically advice, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if it's if it is possible and appropriate for us to say something more along the line is the applicant is re is essentially the applicant is required to ask, and mm -hmm. if granted permission to install. Uh, yeah. But if the select board says no, that would be the final answer. That would be the substance. Okay. Is that yeah, that, that would work. You can require them to request. And if they're denied, then that no big deal. Okay. Uh, project design and construction. Uh, we had gone through this before as well. E9, uh, applicant shall install lighting on the site that conforms to Town of Arlington zoning bylaws and town bylaw and approved lighting plan referred to in condition A2 above. Lighting should be downlit, shielded to prevent light spillover onto surrounding properties and fly out the dark sky requirements. Um, so Mr. Chairman, I, I'm responsible yeah. for the confusion here. Um, in the previous draft, the language was there about uh, lighting should be downlit and shielded mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, as I recall, there was a discussion that said, in effect, that the lighting plan solved this problem mm -hmm. and that we didn't have to go back into it. Um, okay. The other, so I thought that maybe it was unnecessary. Uh, I am concerned about complying with the dark sky requirements because I couldn't find any dark sky requirements. Uh, mm. There, as far as I know, there there is nothing in the town zoning bylaw about lighting that would affect this. Although maybe there's something there in the signs that relates to that that I didn't see. Uh, but the there's town something light, in the general bylaws. The town by yeah the town and that is what the, is referred by the town bylaw. I did a search about of the word dark side requirements under the town bylaw, and there isn't anything there that oh, says that. Uh, and so it seemed to me that the simplest way to deal with this is just the way the applicant agreed to it is, here's my plan. We thought that that plan was okay. If they complied with it, that should be fine. Okay. So you would recommend between the square brackets of deleting that? Section. Yes, yes. The management still remains. Um, you will, 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 before you go over there, uh, you we haven't quite got the word delete in that next line is needs to come out also. The question mark under in the second to last oh, line of the nine. Yeah. Let's 
So this is, oops. Got it. Um, if, uh, let's see what happens if I reject suggestion. Does it blow everything up? Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, e thirteen we had gone over last time. So construction activities we conducted between the hours of seven a.m. to six p.m. Monday through Friday, and between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Saturdays, so between no construction activity Sundays and week holidays. Nice and easy. Um, so in, in E23, <laughs> I made the notes bound and incidental at the at, during last hearing. And for the life of me, I can't remember what they mean. I wasn't sure if anybody has a sense as to what we may have been wanting to do. And this was a condition that the applicant was looking to strike. I will go ahead and strike it because I can't figure out what it was supposed to do. Mr. Chair, I, yeah, I just I just thinking back to that. I think we were we were talking about the last time we we spoke about this provision mm -hmm. um, about the the footings, and I think that that was some somehow in relation to the footings. And I think what we decided was we removed that language. So, okay. So did we? So the way that E23 is now, or did we want to keep it this way, or did we want to exempt the footings and foundation walls? I think my recollection is we wanted to keep it this way. I yeah. think the the incidental note was in relation to the footings because that was sort of an incidental amount of oh, okay. scope. And what we decided was we'd rather it just be all encompassing. Got it. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, E27 is just as the inspectional services department. Um, E30, we had just uh, vehicles approaching and accessing the site uh, or on the truck path diagrams, just including that. Um, E33, any fence installed along the property boundary shall be wood and installed so the finished side faces the abutting property unless otherwise specifically requested by the abutter. Um, and that was specifically in comments. I just wanted to add, make sure that was added. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just just in an abundance of caution, I wonder if uh, just, I'm a little bit nervous about making everything subject to the request of, a, of an abutter. And I just wanted to be assured mm -hmm. that that's not a problem. Yeah, can, can you explain that a little bit better to me, what, what the situation is? Sure. So the applicant had, had on their plans had initially suggested they were going to put a fence around the property, or, or at least around the rear of the property. And so there was some concern about how it would be, what the appearance would be. And so they had agreed that they would make it out of wood as opposed to vinyl or something else. And then the question was, well, which side is it going to face? And wow. so there was some back and forth and they said, well, you know, it's our fence. So it faces the abutter. So the idea was just to because they had made that notice, we would want to include it, um, but we can certainly remove the, unless specifically requested by the abutter, because you know it would be their fence on their property. So um, we could remove that and just stipulate that the finished side faces abutting property. Yeah, why don't we do that? And okay. if the abutter really has a problem with that, they can speak to the applicant. Um, and I think changing the side of the fence <laughs> to what the abutters want is going to be an administrative approval. Okay. So I'd rather do that than keep any sort of condition up to, to an abutter. Very good. Um, let's say this is the spaces. 
No change to the number configuration of designation of parking spaces as shown on the approved plans shall be made unless approved by the board through a modification process. Um, emergency services moving condominium association shall provide for the expansion of the number of change, charging stations in accordance with tenant demand. Um, so this, so this is, language. yeah, this is Go one ahead, of Matt. my, this is one of my problem. Well, you should actually finish your sentence about why this is here. I've got a question as to the appropriateness of it, but. I was just going to say that it was the applicant did not request that it be stricken. Okay. So I don't know exactly. I mean, if you don't have that sentence, then the only obligation that they have is to provide an electric vehicle charging station at the 11 parking spaces in the garage. They may eventually have other obligations by state law, but it would not be part of this. Um, if you add the condominium association shall provide for expansion of the number of charging stations in accordance with tenant demand, that either means nothing because of course that's what they'll do, uh, or it could mean that if any tenant wants it, they could demand it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that last part is what we mean. And I'm pretty sure that they, if they thought about it, wouldn't have agreed to, agreed to it because uh, it's an expensive proposition and they probably don't. But in any event, wh whatever they might have agreed to, we don't really have any basis for mm -hmm. that. And as I understand what the chair just stated, the real reason for this is just to make clear that that it's up to them really and tenant demand is a shorthand for saying what they do in the normal course in any event mm -hmm. um, and i'm all in favor of expanding charging stations and so forth uh, but on the basis of the record we have before us it would seem to me to be a bit much to have something that really did mean that if there's any of these tenants beyond the ones who get the first 11 however they allocate those, mm -hmm. that they automatically get a, an additional one. I, I think what you could do to solve that is just say that the condominium documents shall provide a provision that allows the expansion of the number of charging stations. All right, because I think the, the intent was that we didn't want, we didn't want the condo association to hinder the expansion we wanted to make sure that the, you know if if more spaces were required that the condo association wouldn't block that whose right. spaces are these um, so they're dedicated to the units according and are to, they are they the property of the unit can they be reallocated or suppose can a unit give so them the back? allocation the allocation is per the condo association i believe is the phrasing So we're going to have 11 to start with. Yeah. And 11 particular apartments are are going to, or condos are going to have these spaces. Um, and then is it, so just as a matter of the law, suppose I'm, I'm number 12. Yeah. And I, I want one of these spaces. Um, is this a common area that I gather it's not? So then the condo association doesn't have anything to do with that. And I can put the space in if I want to. If I do, don't I need to have some other use of condo land to, to connect it up to the system and so on? Exactly. And so what this is basically saying is that the condo association will cooperate, will allow all of the necessary hookups and so forth or anybody who individually, presumably at his own expense, is going to put in a uh, an EV station for that person's parking space. That's what the, this condition is going to mean? Yes. So that because, because somebody can't install electrical by themselves, freestanding in their own space, that they would need to have, there would need to be an extension of the base building system. 
and that the con the condominium association should allow for that expansion so that those spaces can be provided now whether those spaces are provided by the condo association or by the individual i don't you know i think it could happen either way but what's most important at least in my mind was that the condo association not hinder or not not you know unnecessarily hinder the expansion of the number of uh spaces so i wonder if in light of that I mean, the fact that I initially read this as probably more likely, meaning it doesn't mean anything at all, and that it's just a matter of, you know, mm -hmm. I should produce widgets to satisfy market demand. Uh, we might want to just re reserve this for a moment and think, and, and not for what I'd like to do is think about making it, if that's what we mean, I don't think it's clear the way it is right now. And okay. think that we ought to we ought to be able to tweak this in order to make it be more explicit of what our intention is. Yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the cost is to the applicant, and I don't know if the applicant testified that they were going to make infrastructure to, you know, convert fifty spaces to have EV stations. Right. So if the number is eleven. And that's the condition that makes sense. That should remain. And I think the only thing you can add to a, a condition without getting into concerns about the cost on the applicant, um, you know, right off the bat, is just provide that the condominium documents provide that if the association or or or, or property owners decide to expand and add charging stations it can happen mm -hmm. i think that that i think that that's that's how the condition should be limited i'm concerned about them reading that condition and saying well i have to make the infrastructure prepared to um, yeah like a whole bunch of uh, ev stations i don't know what the cost of, of something like that would be well if they had to pre-wire everything that would be a pretty i mean i don't right. know what the cost right. is either but that's yeah. That isn't required under the new stretch code necessarily, and and uh, uh, it would it would be a major commitment that we haven't discussed so far. That's that's what's yeah. troubling me. I actually think it would be a great commitment for them to make. I would love to see them do it, but I'm feeling a little uncomfortable raising it now. Okay. Well, then we'll come back to F eight. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. DuPont. So th this may be a bit tangential, but, you know, if you have condominium documents, there are two ways that the parking spaces can go. You know, one is that they're exclusive use areas, so they're assigned in the condominium documents specifically this space for this unit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, though, the condominium association or the trustees actually will assign spaces but they're not exclusive. They're just, you know, we're giving you the use of this space or this space, but it doesn't necessarily go with the unit. It's kind of, uh, you know, in the discretion of the trustees. And as I was listening to your comments, it made me wonder, you know, how you would demand, depending on the way, what right you had to the space, how you could demand that now that you have that electrical charging capability there, mm -hmm. And, you know, once you do that, too, by the way, you're going to have to have all sorts of easements um, for the, you know, for the electrical to go in through the common area. And it might be easy. I don't know how those are set up. But, you know, there, it's more complicated than it may at first seem. Yeah. And, and so I, I think that, you know, sort of the more general you leave the language about just as Mr. Alphen had said, essentially providing a mechanism within the documents for them to address it. I think that's the better approach. Okay. All right, well, let's, we'll come back to this one then. Um, so I think where we left off was after the apps last time. I was, <clears> just, <throat> I was just checking the language here. Um, I thought there was somewhere in here a statement about how those spaces are allocated, but um, I'll have to find it again. Mr. Chair, it is. It's the next, uh, it's F9. 
Oh, thank you. Ah, there we go. So each dwelling unit shall be deeded one parking space to be allocated by the condominium association. So I guess if somebody needed an excess an electrical space and there was somebody use, who was assigned electrical space that was not using it as such, then they could allocate those until the 11 are used up and then they could try to figure out from there. And Mr. Chairman, if I can make a, yeah. an additional comment, when you say in a condominium that a space is going to be deeded, that sometimes is a bit of a vague reference because when you say something is deeded, then you actually are making it a part of your unit. Okay. And in the, when I, I think sometimes when people say this, what they're saying is the deed will contain the right to park in a specific space. So it may be that they're only saying that, but sometimes you know, it could be construed to mean that the deeded part of it makes it part of your unit. And then the question becomes um, in terms of maintenance and repair, because mm -hmm. if you say something is deeded and it's actually part of your unit, then the, the condominium documents are going to say what the responsibility is to care for something that is owned only by you as opposed to it's an exclusive use area. So it's still common area, but it's only for your use, in which case it would probably be maintained by the condominium association. So I'm not sure that the word, maybe nobody cares about mm -hmm. the word deeded, but in fact, I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that deeded is the proper term. I'm just wondering if it should be something more along the lines of, you know, eight, uh, each dwelling unit shall have a parking space allocated to it in uh, the uh, deed. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that approach. Um, usually when you're talking about condominiums, uh, you, you know, it is so-called deeded. Uh, but the member's correct. Sometimes in other situations, depending on how they set up the condominium documents, you may just have a right to use common area. So I think that is the better way to approach that. So if it's, instead of saying deeded, if we just said provided? Yeah, that should be fine. Right. That's sufficient to me. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just to, I, I mean, I entirely agree, but I, I'm just wondering, suppose... Suppose somebody in the original originally has one of the electronic vehicles faces because they have an electric yeah. vehicle. Um, and they then sell their unit to somebody who doesn't have an electric vehicle and has no mm -hmm. use for this. I assume I've been assuming that the way that's dealt with is that the condo association would then reallocate the EV space and that the people moving in would get a space that doesn't have an EV, which they don't need, mm -hmm. uh, and there it would be. Whereas if if it was really their private property and not common space, then you would have a more complicated scenario that they'd acquire it, they don't need it. Presumably they they might or might not be able to rent that to somebody else, but mm -hmm. otherwise you have to rely on private ordering to make it all work out. Uh, and I, th I think that the language we've just come up with comes out to what I think should be the right result, basically, is that the condo association should be free to reallocate in that situation, and that that shouldn't be something that, you, that owners individually have to buy and sell in order to make it all work out right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so F9 we're good with, but we'll leave F8, F8 to come back to still. All right. So moving on to the G's. Um, the applicant had pushed back about this professional property management and such. Um, and so the request was for it to read the condominium association shall provide an emergency contact name and telephone number for representatives of the unit owners and the Arlington Police Department and Fire Department.
so representatives of the unit owners or would that be representatives of the condominium association or is that the same thing if this is just providing a, a phone number i guess i'm not quite sure what we intend here for representatives of i would i think it was that if something was to happen and the police or fire department needs to contact the yeah, so you know, contact the building. Who do they call? And before it was easier because you know prior ones were all rentals, and so there was a management company. But there's not really a management company here necessarily. Mr. We're trying to figure out how that works. Yes, Roger. So I mean, usually when you say representatives of the unit owners, the unit owners association is really spelled. That's the trust, the condominium trust. Mm -hmm. And so typically when you're talking about dealing with uh, representatives of the unit owners, you're talking about the trustees. And if Mr. Alfin has <laughs> something to add to that, I'd be happy to hear. But I mean, typically that's when you need to deal with the condominium, you deal with the trustees. Okay. And I, don't, I don't know if that's something that we want to say explicitly, um, but somebody has to be in charge. And again, it's typically the trustees. And unless they've assigned, because the trustees can assign a specific per a person right. as, you know, as the uh, liaison, if you will, uh, okay. they can certainly do that. But, right. Uh, you know. I think that's exactly right, is that it is the trustees, but oftentimes the trustees outsource uh, you know, maintenance responsibilities and things like this to a management company. So, you know, keeping it the representatives of the unit owners is completely fine. And, you know, between the applicant and the town, we can designate who that is. So can we just, I mean, if, if we go back and read the part that doesn't, that isn't done, this is a really simple condition. It says the condo association shall be providing these phone numbers. So we're not thinking about the condo association as somehow being the representative's owners. What they're providing are emergency contact names and telephone numbers. And I think that all that was intended by representatives of the unit orders is that in some of these, the tenant, the person who needs to call the fire department, isn't the owner. It's a tenant of the owner. And so the idea basically is the person who sees the fire should be have the number to call the fire department. And, you know, we ought to be able to figure out a way of saying that with fewer syllables. I mean, maybe you can just say for unit orders and any tenants and leave it at that. I, I, I think the way that it is is fine because although they might be tenants um the representative of the unit owners are the people that we want the phone number to so i, I again i think between the applicant and the town we'll, we'll get the right unit owner we just don't know whether that's going to we're going to get the right phone number we just don't know whether that's going to be um a property management company or the actual trustees well, we do know it's not going to be a property management company because they made it clear that that's what was planned. They were planning on, or at least we know as much as we could can possibly know that now. Yeah. But anyway, the condo association is there, and I don't know. It's I whatever you whatever you want to do. Usually, finding the number of the police department and the fire department is something you don't normally look at your condo association for. There are lots of ways of doing it, including calling 911. So I'm not 100% sure how important all this is. So it might actually be make more sense if we change the word and to the word to. Yeah, that's. I think that's what it meant to say. Sorry, I missed that. Right. It should be two, exactly, right. That's the purpose of this condition, Right, is that the town have these phone numbers. So that's exactly right. Okay. All right, then G2, so we had written in specific numbers for the separations, and I believe that uh, there are a couple of people who sort of pointed this out. So just change, just read, the stairwells and garages 
must provide the required fire rated separation. Residential units must have a minimum one hour fire rated separation. And that then puts it back on the state building code as to what those actual numbers are. Be. Uh, the residential structure shall be fully sprinkled to NFPA regulations. Um, because this doesn't necessarily have to be in both locations, but this is if somebody is looking specifically for things about the fire conditions related to fire, this is where they would look. I mean, by, they're not going to get a building permit if it's not to NFPA either. So, I mean, there's to some extent we could not, we could just bypass having it in here at all. Or should we just get rid of G3 and just keep G4? Does G3 add anything to G4? I don't think so. I guess I just, I deleted. Yeah. I had a comment here that I don't know anymore why I did, but there's a CE up there that I thought was also saying the same as G, what was previously G3. It must have been C1E or something. I don't, I don't remember what the footnote, what the comment refers to. C2E? Yeah. Yeah. This one here in the back sprinkler system. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to note that um, you know, these uh uh clerical issues can be fixed up by town staff mm -hmm. um, you know, not during the public hearing. Okay. okay. Um all elevators must have emergency battery or generator backup as required by the code. They're providing a generator, but it can be either. Uh, Project shall maintain access for fire department personnel to all four sides of the residential structure. Um, and then there was a question here about on G8. Um, so, yeah, so. There was a question about them having to have standpipes up being operational during construction. Um, and so building code section 3311 requires it. So um, there was just a question as to whether or not that's actually required. And yes, it is. Um, so that's the end of the G's. Um, Water suitor in utilities. We didn't have any questions that had come up on prior on those. Those are the H's. Uh, I, it's the wetland floodplain environmental conditions. Um, the prior commencement. The applicant should provide a bond. So we never received a bond amount from the Conservation Commission. Um, and Certainly, the applicant did not think that they should have to pay a bond. Um, so I don't think we should. I don't feel comfortable with us assigning a number to that. Um, in lieu of that, obviously, that there, the app, the the reason for that bond is for the applicant to do the work that they're required to do, um, and. They are signing on to a 10 year monitoring program to ensure that they did what they said they were going to do. So in, in many ways, this is a condition that isn't really required per se. Um, so I just wanted to see what the board thought about just going ahead and striking it. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, 
this has always been sort of controversial, but it, I feel that if, if this is a bond that's under the wetlands protection bylaw, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have any record for establishing any particular amount of the bond, and the Conservation Commission, whose bond it is really, uh, who's trying to get something to enforce their condition, doesn't give us a sufficient basis to establish a bond, uh, that we just shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So we could say the applicant shall provide a bond in the amount of zero dollars. I don't really think. Yeah, I I don't know whether there's I don't really see an advantage to that. I and it sort of is, in my mind, at least sticking a finger in the eye of the conservation commission. I just as soon not address it. Okay. Everybody else comfortable with striking I two? Can I just clarify, does that mean that there is no bond that can be imposed under the wetlands bylaw now because it's not contained in the decision, in the conditions? Or, or is it just something that happens within the purview of the Conservation Commission? I just no, it would be something that. that we can't, this is pursuant to the bylaw rather than the state. So if this would be something that would be part of the comprehensive permit, if we do, if, if it's going to be done by anybody, now it has to be done by us. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify. But if we don't know, we don't know. Right. I mean, we, we have our prior decisions with, with values included, but and they were kind of site specific too. We had we right. had we would went back and forth a lot about those. I mean, I just think it should the burden should be on the conservation commission to give us the ability to do this without speculating. I I just think that if they wanted to do that, they they've they've consciously addressed this before. It's been present in every decision up to now, and and I mm. if they let it go, they let it go. Yeah, I would just yeah. Hate for them to feel like you know it it was missed as an oversight but, but if it is it is we can't correct it now we, we can't correct it now if the hearing was still open we could call them and ask what they meant but not they we yeah. can't do that anymore yeah okay may i ask a question please dan um are are we able to just say that they could provide a bond in the amount determined by the the Conservation Commission is—is is that not appropriate? Could we Mr. could we just reference? Well, I, I'm a little concerned. Um, I, I I see that there was some sort of agreement between you and the applicant about conditions related to an order of conditions, mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, the applicant just needs to meet the state requirements, and this is a local requirement. Right. Um, so I, I I think this is something that should be um, discluded from the decision unless there was a major reason to have it. Right. So this was something that the applicant had wanted to strike. Yeah. could strike it. And then I three was dewatering. I four that no stockpiling materials permitted within the hundred wet foot hundred foot wetland buffer zone or aura. Um, as to these have to do with dumpsters, heavy equipment storage, dirt and debris, tracked, um, stormwater management system, about using slow release fertilizers, plant nutrients comply with state law, uh, pervious surfaces shall be maintained. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. This is never changed, but I just like to note for the record uh, the provisions of condition I nine, which 
uh, particularly when you're talking about uh, pesticides and rodenticides and integrated pest management, that's addressing a matter of great concern to the community, and I'm happy to yeah. have it here. Absolutely. Um, there's snow storage, catch basins, uh, submit copies, the reports, um, an invasive management plan. So rather than outlining, they would just say in compliance with the order of conditions, and it's condition J52. Um, and all mitigation plantings and all plantings within the resource areas should be native. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So um, are we capitalizing resource areas uh, that I think it, we have oh. been doing that? And, and the other question I had, because I, I want to clarify for myself, is when we say the aura and other resource areas, do we know what we are defining as other resource areas? Um, you, so I, you you probably do. I'm just I want to make sure yeah. I'm clear on that. So there's the aura, which is the the upland resource area, but then there's because they're within there's a river. Yeah. There's the 200 front riverfront resource area. But as a term of art, it, it's something that would be ascertainable. Yes. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. And they said they were going to put in an irrigation system, so that was included. Um, all plantings, planted invasive species removed through this project shall be monitored for three years. Offsite enhancement. The Millbrook condominiums property shall be monitored for two years. So that that is the the stuff that's on the Millbrook condominiums property. That's the stuff that's immediately adjacent to Millbrook. And this is now this is actually no longer correct. So this is again that older language. Um, so all of this here really should again reference um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure that this is J47. correct. The, 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 is the is the provision about I'm not sure what the right answer is for this. The yeah. this goes back to the question we had before, but the here the applicant has to submit recommendations for replacements to the ZBA for approval. I don't know whether that's in. It would be a strange thing to say in an order of conditions, and I'm wondering if if the two are not really parallel but distinct. And if that were true, we see again in the next paragraph the seven year period which is set forth in, in full here as a condition. Mm -hmm. And I just think that we may have, I mean, we, we may have enough variations in some of these things that it makes it different. It, may, it makes it important to repeat them. Yeah. Uh, but this may be what, what Mr. Alfin notes as a technical thing, but, you know, we, we do just kind of need to, to get this clear, I, I, for the reasons I said earlier, I like having something that fully sets forth the seven year commitment in the comprehensive permit right. so that it's really clear what the authority for that is. And this is a clearer way of doing it than the way we did it before. Okay. So what we could do is modify. So June here is supposed to be November 15th. So we can make that change. We could keep this, the survival rate, I believe in the order of conditions, the survival rate was 90%. So I can modify this this to match that right. number. Yep. 
And then er, previously where we referenced J47 and J48, we could instead reference I-17. Yes, I think that would, I think that works. That works better? I think it does. We need to, we, we, we're gonna have to sit down with the exact language and go back and forth to be sure, but I think it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the applicant shall protect all area trees on the property for the town wetland protection regulations. Um, are there actually going to be trees to protect? Probably not. There was some question about protecting trees off-site, but they we don't have the the right to request that. But if there are no trees, then they just don't do it. Right. All on-site mitigation is proposed as part of this project shall remain in perpetuity, et cetera. Sensing, I know that the there is a specific number applied to how what the clearance is um, that's included in the order of conditions. Um, and this is not urban forest. No unleashed pets, impervious pavement to be pitched best the practical direct water towards landscaped areas instead of towards the street. Project is to maintain existing drainage patterns at the property boundary so that no runoff is directed to abutting properties or that runoff from abutting properties is not otherwise blocked from following the path prior to development of the project, um, which was in the Tetra Tech comments. Um, so that brings us to I-23, so the second I-23. Um, so to mitigate the increase of impervious area on the site and the significant loss of existing tree panic, canopy, the applicant is to provide and maintain for three years, three additional street trees of the same species as those provided on the project site to be planted along Massachusetts Avenue at the direction of the tree committee. Um, so this was, um, this is a, something we had recommended. The applicant was objected to it, um, but the applicant is doing, you know, is doing a significant amount on this site that is, you know, increasing the coverage of the site, but also is cut is increasing, uh, you know, is taking down some significant trees as a part of what it's doing. And the public, the primary thing that the public has been concerned about in most of our hearings has been the the loss of the tree canopy and that the the restored woodland at the rear may not be sufficient in order to offset the loss. Um, so I would I'd like to hear from the you know, members of the board how they feel about putting this condition back in. If we were to do so, what would be an appropriate wording of this condition? Hey, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Could I, in the answer to your first question, I think it is appropriate to have this condition or a condition that does what this is doing um, in there. Uh, I see two difficulties that we need to figure out. One I think is maybe easier than the other. Um, the easier one I believe is that the tree committee would not be the appropriate agency for directing anything here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that that would be uh, either that uh, either with the approval of the tree warden was what I think or something of that kind. But the official that ought to be supervising this should be the tree warden rather than the tree committee, which is not an executive agency of the town. Um, the second is, is that I'm not 100 percent sure where these trees are going to be. Uh, and but as I recall, they're not necessarily on site or even on the frontage area here. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it may or may not be true that in the place where you want to put these trees, the applicant has the property rights to do that. Uh, it may be that the town has the property rights that mm -hmm. would make it possible if this was like within a public right of way. Uh, and in which case it would be subject to, I mean, the one part of the town saying yes and the other part having to say yes also to make it happen. Uh, if it involves private property, it's not entirely clear to me what we should do. So mm -hmm. to me, figuring out how to write this in a way that, that, uh, uh, that doesn't put them into the position of making offsite improvements where they don't have the property rights to do that. And I footnote that I'm not 100%, not 1000% confident of our right to require them to make offsite improvements at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have an adequate reason for it. Uh, but to say that and then make sure that we don't have something that obstructs the entire project, if somebody who's necessary to, to, cooperate with this plan doesn't do it um, is I think a, I don't have a, an immediately tricky and immediately uh, good drafting answer for decide defining what we, exactly we think their obligations should be in that way. It might be serious it might be easier if some of the rest of you remember in a way that I don't whether we're talking about off-site properties at all. Uh, but it wasn't even clear to me that we were necessarily talking about properties on the side of the street. Um, and so I'm a little bit nervous about just sending them off to find some tr place where you can do a tree. I will say that the applicant, when we discussed this to them, refused to do it, but didn't say it was impossible to do. Right. right. It was just that they thought that they had done enough and they did not want to be asked to do any more. But they, as I, I don't recall, they're making an argument. I guess I could go back and look at the transcript, but I don't recall them saying, and in any event, we don't have the property interests in doing this or we couldn't do this on the right side of the street or whatever. But they may have said something like that. I just don't remember. So we could say the applicant is to provide three additional street trees of the same species as those provided on the project site to be planted along Massachusetts Avenue with the approval of the tree warden. Or we could say provide up to three trees, which would then, you know, working with the warden, they could figure out what makes sense. Yeah, you'd have to be careful. You don't want to, uh, zero trees is up to three trees. So I want to make, right. you want to make clear that <laughs> it's three, but they get excused if the tree warden says that that's not feasible. Mr. Chair. Yes. W would we be able to, so from my recollection, we were, you know, the, the conversation around this was that, um, the the applicant did not want to pay into the tree fund um and so mm -hmm. part of what we were thinking was that this would be sort of in lieu of paying into the tree fund that we, right. they would they would provide three street trees or whichever number we decide on street trees along mass ave that would be yeah. adjacent to the site um i i think it probably would not be on their property uh because i think that we sort of maxed out the amount of Mm -hmm. green space that can uh, accommodate trees on their property. So I understand Ms. Mr. Hanlon's concerns, but I wonder, uh, and I'm just trying to think about how we could structure this, but I wonder if, you know, we could sort of use the language that you started, um, but then 
make clear that it's conditional. You know, they, from my perspective, it would be fine if they paid what they owed into the tree fund as as an option, mm -hmm. or they could provide these three street trees, and that might involve working with the town and potentially an abutting neighbor uh, in order to coordinate, you know, the rights to do that. I, I don't know what others think, but maybe maybe that would be one way that we could offer them um, the ability to work outside their property limits, um, it, you know, as, as one option, or they could just pay into the tree fund, which is really what the bylaws would have dictated if we didn't give them this waiver. No. I, th I think though that the, they're cutting down enough trees that if they actually applied the bylaw, I'd be a little bit, a bit afraid of disproportionate. You either plant mm -hmm. two trees or you have your cut head cut off. And, you know, if, if it was pro rata or something or having an option to say either to pay into the, the tree fund or, or not might make, make more sense, but I'm, I'm a little afraid that there's enough involved here that it might make the project uneconomic. I, I know I know that we asked this question the last time and it's okay if we don't have an answer, but do, do we have a general sense of what that value was for um, the 77 trees that are being removed on the property? I know it's the value is by the caliber. Okay. I think, but it, but again, it also only counts for trees that are within the step required setback. Anything beyond the required setback, you're free to take. So the the actual number of trees is lower. Um. Is it still lost out? So would it be possible to, when we do the waiver, yeah. to waive the fee under the, the tree fund? Um, up to a certain extent, right? And then you define that extent by something that is approximates what we think would be the reasonable value of doing these just three trees. Uh, and then provide either an alternative to, to pay the, to pay that into the tree fund or to provide the specific trees. I mean, the awkward thing is, is what we want is the trees here, right? And mm -hmm. the, the, if it just goes into the town's general tree fund, good goodness, no, it, there's no guarantee that anything will be done here so that it isn't. A, and, and so you want that kind of a nexus, but I don't know that we have the authority to impose that on the town. Right. I, I agree with you, Mr. Hanglin. I think it, it you know, we would like the trees, we would like to push them into uh, providing the trees adjacent to the site because that's where they could really use them and uh, the neighbors would benefit. Uh, it would offset the loss of all the trees that are existing there or help to offset the loss of the trees that are existing there. But it feels like if we were to pro provide some value as an alternate that they could pay into the tree fund that if, for instance, there was no, I'm not saying that this is the case, but if there was no uh, abutter that would want to allow them to plant trees on their property or within their sidewalk area, then they would not be without a, a path to compliance. Is this an off-site location? So these trees would be off-site, yes. So the, what I'm hearing from the board is that 
they either want them to attempt to plant trees on this offsite location or pay a fee into the town's tree fund. Well, they already they already have an obligation to pay into the tree fund. What they want is a waiver of that obligation. Right. And right. What we are contemplating is giving them a partial waiver to it if they provide the, this as in in kind, so to speak, rather than uh, as part of the obligation the other way have. We would be within our rights, subject to making the project uneconomic, to say they have to pay the whole everything into the tree fund. That's what the bylaw says. They want to be excused from that. Okay, I, I think there's an argument to be made there. Uh, my concern is that this is an offsite matter uh, and that the purpose of the condition is not related to the impact of the project. So it's also partially because they are doing a, they, you know, they're basically clear cutting a wooden site in order to construct what they're constructing. Um, and so there's, and there's, a, you know, there's a lot of concern about the loss of can tree canopy. And so we're trying to find a way to get them to ameliorate that. Um, they are providing this you know, restoration woodland at the rear of the project, but that is tied directly to the issues with the Conservation Commission. It's not necessarily tied to condition, tied to the issue that they're removing all the trees from the site. Um, and so we're trying to find a, a way to um, encourage them to increase the tree can't, you know, if they're not going to increase the tree canopy on their on this, you know, they're incre they're putting trees back on the site as best they can, but they're not going to be at full canopy status for you know 10, 15 years. Is there something else that can be done to help mitigate the the sudden increase in the amount of um, area that's not that has lost its canopy? Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I. I would say I think of it as slightly differently from that because mm -hmm. I mean, if you the, the thing that is troubling here is with with respect to Massachusetts Avenue in particular, is that uh, that whole area because of the increased amount of development in it is just going to get hotter. Uh, it's currently somewhat deficient in trees. The applicant mm -hmm. is actually doing a good job of dealing with his immediate issue right in front of his property and I, I i don't particularly criticize that at all uh that still leaves a small island of a, of a couple of trees and we're dealing with really a few more that is intended to take this the area that's immediately adjacent to this property is not far away uh and to essentially improve the heat item effect and the kind of the kind of negative things that have you know, a lot of bare concrete, which they're contributing to by building such a big, uh, such a big building that that uh, is is necessarily going to increase the amount of impervious service a lot. Uh, so it does seem to me there's a quid pro quo there, and it's intended to represent. It's intended to benefit the tenants of this building, which is to say the successors of the owner, um, uh, as well. And of course, it's much smaller than the whole woodland uh, before. But at least for me, always the woodland both counted in terms of its merits. It counted both for it, it had a relationship both for the conservation commission things, but also the fact that getting rid of the native species and having a planned woodland here that is put together more in appropriate in appropriate relation to urban forestry principles would ultimately, not immediately, but after a period of time, produced a, a canopy that would be much better than we would have if we even we just left it alone in the non-build situation. 
and so that is kind of a net improvement there. But there's lots of things going on, and I'm not sure that one is all the way to the finish line when you add up how far you get uh, with the upland woodland. And this has, after all, a relatively modest additional additional requirement. But of course, it is going to produce something else that's going to take some time to actually produce a canopy. It's not like you're mm -hmm. putting in anything that's remotely like the very large trees that they're eliminating and that to some extent provide shade that cools this whole area that won't be provided once they've taken it down. Right. All right, so how do we resolve this? Um, I think that we should resolve this by putting it in the same sack as F8. Okay. And try to think about how to do this over the course of the next of the next few days. This is something that, um, that we we just need to have some draft language or alternative draft language to to work with. Making it up on the spot is not going to. Okay. It's too hard. All right. So we'll move on to the J's. Um, so these are the other conditions that under the Wetland Protection Act. So per agreement between the applicant, the board, and the Conservation Commission, here after the con commission, the order of conditions apart from the standard conditions issued under the commission's review under the Wetlands Protection Act are included here in the written decision for reference. So under standard conditions, J1 through J30, standard conditions, excuse me, J20, Standard conditions of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection as recorded in the commission's written decision. Um, so we're not going to include those, but then it's the specific ones. So these, we're not going to adjust the language on any of them because they are direct from the Conservation Commission. Um, but we, and as best I could tell in my review last week, I, the only place where there was I saw an issue was the specifically under 47 and 48, it's the some of these survival rate percentages that we need to adjust in hours to correspond with this. Um, and so uh, I need to go back and make that adjustment. Right. And Mr. Chairman, just notice that on 47, for example, uh, it says as determined by the condition mm -hmm. commission, and I suspect. In fact, I think I remember that the language we had earlier in our own bylaw uh, was unless otherwise approved by the ZBA. Uh, okay. And but 48 is entirely a ZBA thing because it or, and that's properly so. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I I don't really think that we I mean I I think we're I think we're fine. We should just make sure that we understand where these things are all going. But if it's by the ZBA that's establishing a principle that mm -hmm. if some of this happens, they've got to then file with both of us. Correct. And certainly in 48, it requires that they be a that they report to both of us. Right. And explicitly says so. Before it's yeah. in 47, it's by implication because we have two parallel mm -hmm. provisions, but here it says both, and that's exactly what we want. Yeah, right. And then this is the Millbrook part, which is two years instead of three years. And then there's, it just goes on and on and on.
through J72. Right. So, Mr. Chairman, just to be clear, at least the way I look at this, when we say that all of these things are here by reference, mm -hmm. it, it means that we are not independently undertaking to enforce these. So if we do want to independently take to enforce these, we have to have we have to have the authority stuck in some other provision than J. So we could state at the start of J. That they're included here in the written decision. And then rather than say saying for reference, we could say our and our our, you know, our made conditions of the of the comprehensive permit. I'm not sure that we can get away with doing that. I, I, let me. I mean, this may be another question for Mr. Alvin, but these things are all under the state act, and the right. enforcement authority under the state act is the conservation commission. And I'm not 100. I mean, I, as a matter of just government practice, it doesn't seem sensible for us to try to create ourselves as independently somehow an enforcement authority for state law under a comprehensive permit that explicitly excludes state law. So I feel a lot happier just letting the, making sure that we've noted what the position of the Conservation Commission is, but leaving the enforcement entirely up to them. Yeah, I, I think that that's legally implied. I don't think it needs to be included in the decision. Um, oftentimes, uh, the terms and conditions of an order of conditions are not incorporated into a comprehensive permit decision. That doesn't mean that you can't, uh, and that's what you're doing, and that's just in order to create a clearer record to make sure that the applicant does what he's supposed to do, and um, you know the, the, uh, everybody is aware that this is a conditions as part of a decision, but whether the enforcement officer is the building commissioner or the conservation commission uh, that is sort of um uh you know implied by law so there's no need to add anything to the decision about that okay all right so then uh, i think we're good then with section j uh then section k would be other general conditions uh, um most of these are fairly boilerplate um this should, so when it will be final shall comply with local regulations of the town unless otherwise waived so copy the board and all correspondence prohibits parking storage of any under registered vehicle on the site service of vehicles on the site except for construction overnight parking of vehicles on public ways is to comply with the bylaws of the town of arlington parking of vehicles on private ways without the permission of the property owner is likewise prohibited um I'm not sure if the term likewise is advisable here. In the event that the condominium association or its management company fails to maintain the stormwater management system, then the town can fix it, basically, is all this says. Private roads shall remain private. Um, and any default of the conditions. And then that brings us to the decision itself in consideration of all the foregoing, including plan documents, testimony given during the public hearing. Board hereby grants the applicant a comprehensive permit for the construction of 50 home ownership condominium units in a single structure, along with approximately 1,700 square feet of commercial space pursuant to chapter 40B, section 2323 for the development described above, and then a record of the vote. So when the board is prepared to make a vote, um, this is what the vote would be. Um, filing stuff, and then again, back to the waivers. Um, uh, the project to be constructed as proposed originally it had was much more descriptive about the units and such and we had decided to just say the project construction is proposed um, and then the rest of the waiver those waivers were all fine 
waiver six is about the bike parking. And so we just said the waiver was denied as unnecessary. Pursuant to 40B regulations, the comprehensive permit subsumes all local permitting requirements accordingly. This comprehensive permit includes a finding of unusual circumstances unique to the property under the local bylaw, thus no waiver is required. So it just, the waiver is unnecessary because we have the authority to deal, to do it. Um, then seven, we had talked about sort of tangentially, the applicant requests a waiver, the requirement to make a payment to the tree fund for the removal of protected trees. And they said, in lieu of the riverfront restoration proposed in the approved plans, um, that the riverfront restoration was to get the Conservation Commission on board. It was not, I don't think it was, in order to not have to pay to the tree fund. I'm not quite sure that that statement that I've highlighted there in Fuchsia is correct. Um, but Mr. Chairman, if it's what they asked for. Yeah. Then it is what it is. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, but then we have to decide if we are granting the waiver or if we're not. So, right. so that we still have to fix. Um, I should go ahead. Oh, just have the answer here is we really, really want to, but we haven't quite figured out the way to get there yet. Yeah. So we'll put our red flag on that one. Um, then wetlands protection was then is unnecessary because we can act 15 the stormwater management necessary we can act but then we had added the architectural historical commission that was just the arc is the arlington historic structures inventory um that's unnecessary because we can act uh again uplighting the applicant has removed all uplighting fixtures from the project inflow of trees we, that's granted Waiver from step back requirements was granted. And then um, we had added about, they had wanted different work hours. And so we had to draft a waiver for that specifically. Chairman, do you know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to the discussion that we had a few minutes ago uh, relating to what would be covered as a, a fee in the in the tree bylaw, and mm -hmm. it, it refers to uh, uh, it refers to the removal of trees and the setbacks. Yeah, does that mean the setback before we just waived it in lieu of a lower set setbacks, <laughs> or does it mean that the setback as it was to start with? I think it would apply to the setbacks, the original setbacks, which includes the big stripe down the middle, because it's two lots. Oh, right. So, so I, would setback be, I don't know. That That's a pretty aggressive me reading of the bylaw, but maybe that's what it said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're happy to look into that issue. I understand mm -hmm. the board's concern. Um, and I'm happy to talk to Paul Haverty and yeah. we put our heads together and, and come up with a recommendation. That would be okay. great. Yeah, so it's those two sections. It's F8 and yeah. I23. Yeah. And then uh, then it, as it relates, but then we would need to adjust uh, the board's action to waiver number seven. Right. So are there any other concerns by members of the board about what is included in this decision? Have we missed anything or is there anything that sticks out in your mind that we need to still consider? Mr. Chairman, what did we do about number, I think it was number 39. It, it was the filing of the operation and maintenance plan. 
we were perplexed about Do you that. Remember which? Oh golly, it was uh, it was in the it was in the statement of facts, but it read like a condition. It was the one oh, that okay. the formatting was all screwed oh, up on. Here we go. Here yeah. We go. Um, So clearly it doesn't belong there. And I guess the and and it is also equally clear that an ONM plan is integrally a part and there's provisions in section J that deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess the question that I have is whether there is a reason why it is that we want them to file this, maybe so Mr. Chenard sees it or something like that. Uh, if there is, we should put it down in the conditions, I guess. I guess I don't, I'm not quite sure where, but the but we should stick it down there. If not, I'd feel comfortable. Uh, I think deleting this because you know it's this is really meat and, as I think I said before, meat and potatoes for the conservation commission. They're all over the operation, maintenance, and erosion, and know what to do with it. And I, with with the exception that Mr. Chenard might think it's helpful, uh, I don't see why it needs to be in the comprehensive permit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just looking to see if it might be a glitch in Word that kicked it up from one of the conditions, but I don't see that language anywhere in the conditions. So I can honestly say I have no idea where that came from. Well, we'll t I think we should just take a look at that, but I'd be inclined to remove it unless there was a good reason to put it in because I no agree. I, I, And I can I can take a deeper dive back through the older versions to see if it's anywhere, but the I odd formatting of it makes it look like it was a copy and paste, and I can't figure out why. Right. But I do believe that there's probably something very similar in Section J. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, other things that I know are similar to in Section J, but there may be something similar just to this. Yeah. Well, this is the only time the word sedimentation occurs in the entire document. That's interesting. Very operation and maintenance. So that that might be the more. That's not copied. It's if it was. Yeah. So I, I, my understanding, there's going to be another hearing. Um, we have one more section where we're hoping to have everything buttoned up before. Okay, great. Before so I, it, it, we can certainly make sure that that is incorporated correctly somewhere, okay. um, because I think oftentimes that uh, maintenance agreement plan is incorporated into one of the plans by reference. Okay. Uh, but I, but usually I, I use um, some sort of condition, standard condition that uh, the plan will be submitted to the town. And um, and it's not just with the conservation commission; uh, it should be with 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 the town engineer. Okay. So I can add that in. Okay, that's right. good. So I will I will go ahead and wrestle with this tonight to sort of sort out the bugs in Word and get it to sit a little bit better, and then I'll forward it off first thing tomorrow morning uh, to everyone and. Um, to Mr. Alphen and to Mr. Haverty as well. Um, so everybody has it uh, for the joy of reading it over the weekend, because of course we're gonna meet again Tuesday when Monday's a holiday. So there's not a lot, it looks like a lot of time between now and Tuesday, but it's really not a lot of time between now and Tuesday. Uh, you're so, still within your, your 40 days. Um, oh yeah. Just, just as a procedural, I'm sure this board already knows, but. Uh, when when we have the final, you know, proposed final decision practically on Tuesday, uh, you know, if there's some final remarks, you know, you can still make a vote, you know, conditioned on, you know, the certain final remark, remarks the board has made in the hearing, and then a vote can happen, and then the decision can get really tidied up, and then signed. Okay. Okay. You don't want to give us too many outs. 
<laughs> no, we'll keep we'll keep going forever if you get the right, chance. Right, so. right, <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, this is a good decision, and I, I I applaud this board for going through it and understanding each and every condition. Uh, a lot of boards ignore doing that, and this is a good practice. Um, you know, some boards say, uh, "Yeah, I'll approve it," and you know, somebody read up the decision, and we're going to sign it. So I applaud this board for going through it and understanding everything. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, um, I think we sort of know our marching orders between now and Tuesday. So I think we could go ahead and continue this. Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hanlon, I was just going to call on you. Oh, good. Well, I hope not to make the motion, but I was about, I would make the motion, but I, I just would would like to have the sense of my colleagues whether we could start a little bit late i've got a i'll be journeying back from skating in very far off parts of boston and braving 95 and getting here just in time to to do the meeting at 7 30 and uh, i would be a lot more i would be a lot more reliable if it was 7 45 or 8 o'clock on the other hand you might be a lot quicker if you kept it at 7 30. <laughs> um would the board be amenable to starting at at 8 p.m on the on tuesday the 30th yeah let's do it i promise we'll be faster <laughs> all right so then uh with that um, I would look for a motion to continue the meeting for 1021, 1027 Massachusetts Avenue to Tuesday, May 30th, 2023 at 8 p.m. Second. Or so moved. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And the second? Yep, second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So it's a vote to continue. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. The chair votes aye. We are continued on a meeting for 1021-1027 Massachusetts Avenue until Tuesday, May 30th, 2023 at 8 p.m. Great. Well, thank you all very much for your deliberations tonight. Um, so now our next meeting will be Tuesday, May 30th at 8 um and we have to have everything done by the end of that week so by june 4th everything has to be in then after that meeting our next meeting is tuesday june 13th which is the comprehensive permit for sunnyside and then tuesday june 20th we have a regular meeting um of the board i believe there's now only two items on that agenda um and that's our and then as mr hanlon had noted me the other day um the next meeting after june 20th would be july 11th which would be 410 sunnyside all right any question about our schedule nope Being mr, mr. None, chairman like... could i just before uh, before i move to yeah. return i just like to compliment and thank uh miss ralston for being on the line all of this time uh, I'm sure I'm sure parts of it must have been terribly boring, but uh, but she she does a lot of stuff that goes way beyond the call of duty and is is always there for us. And I just wanted to express her appreciation. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanna. That's very well, very well taken. Thank you. Um, and I would also like to. Uh, uh, thank uh, Christopher Alvin for stepping in. Um, oh, th Mr. Thanks for having me. Good order. time. Not a problem. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Colleen Ralston, Christopher Alvin for their assistance this evening. Uh, please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of our proceedings. It is our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days or weeks. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email. 
zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank Second. You. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. There's a motion to adjourn. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Dubon, how do you move? How Aye. Do you vote on it? Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. I will uh, get you a revised draft uh, first thing tomorrow morning. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Good night.